Hello, everyone. Welcome to Carp Conversations, Episode 4. I'm waiting on Larry and Dan. There we go. We are here. There we go. There we go. How's it going, guys? There we go. Good, good to see you guys. Of course, my you dog too. starts barking as soon as we turn it on. Isn't that perfect? <laughs> hey, come on. You're okay. I'm Lay surprised down. my girlfriend's cat isn't in my lap. For <laughs> trying to be. Lay down. How's it going, everyone? I see a lot of friendly, familiar faces, and I see some new ones. So welcome, everyone. Uh, um, all right, so we're here. We're episode four of the Carp Conversation. Can you guys believe that we're doing this again and that people are excited about it? I can't believe it. Well, so if they listen, watch man. this... If yeah, if they watch this one, it's like Star Wars. You start at episode four, and then you, you know go back to the prequels, do one, two, three on YouTube. You know, we kind of are because well, we're, we are, but we aren't. I guess it depends on if you're a fly tire, right? Like if you're if you're a fly tire, you're probably going to be like, oh, I'm going to tie some carp flies, and I'm going to try to go fish for carp. So if you're a fly tire, we've done these in a sort of logical order. If you're not a fly tire, this is kind of like. The prequel series where like <laughs> we told you how to tie flies even though you might not tie flies but now we're finally telling you guys where to find them yeah, yeah well yeah it started cool. it started out of the the doldrums of of the winter when you're t it's like started out of tying season you know this whole idea but yeah learning i mean why not just just keep it going and teach people you know where to fish and how to catch these fish so yeah it's great great idea Luke. well thanks for thanks for roping us into this by the way well i'm glad that uh it would have been real boring if this was just one person talking that is for sure i uh yeah this is a good group um I, you know so sorry I, I had a request to see leo so i put him up on my lap for a second it's beautiful i think he's welcome to lend some of his opinions he's been carp fishing he's been Spent a lot of time looking for carp. He probably has things to say. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's a good partner. Uh, okay, so I'm just going to briefly recap kind of things that we talked about last season, if anybody hasn't seen the previous episodes. Um, so, like Larry said, we started this kind of in the doldrums of winter last year, and so we started out talking. Our first conversation was, like, what are your favorite materials for tying carp flies? And so we all kind of shared some favorite uh, materials for carp. Um, I actually didn't go and rewatch that one, so I can't remember everything that we said. But people, people can watch that. Uh, it was then, all smart. Then... It was all smart, creative, intelligent. I, I went and watched. It was groundbreaking. It was worded well. Yep, it was worded well. Here's uh, my conversation partner that I told you guys would try to join me. Uh, okay. He might not make an appearance, actually. Uh, and then in the next episode, we talked about uh, some of our favorite flies. And I know one kind of theme there, um, you know, it really depended on what kind of water we fished. Uh, but we also talked a lot about just food or uh, flies being generally foodie. Uh, people can go and look at that, but um, talked about some of those things. And then the last one that we did was talking about gear. So if you didn't watch the first three episodes that's kind of what those covered i think they're fun even if you've carp fished a lot i think it's just fun to talk about, about those things so and you can always learn from something uh so tonight uh we are going to talk about finding carp so i'm just going to tell a little bit a little bit about you guys in case uh there are people that don't know who you guys are uh so dan uh used to be the fly fishing editor for carp pro magazine he wrote Orvis's 101 uh, Carp Flies book, which I reference frequently. Um, anything, uh, there's probably other important things I should say. You've helped out with hosted trips. You've just generally been carp fishing a long, long time. Anything else? Anything else? Yeah. For your carp I, credentials, Dan? I, I, yeah, I think the highest point in my carp fishing career was when, what, 12 years? years ago or something luke when you came out and we caught those uh mirror carp on that little lake that were uh, eating dry flies it wasn't as long ago as we think it was i think that was eight years ago was it eight or nine I think um, it was, yeah anyways that was cool yeah and fish that little stream that was a good time that was super, super cool uh seems like a weird highlight but i mean 
I'll, I'll take it. You fished a lot of cool places, so, but that was a fun time. Uh, <laughs> Larry uh, is the former president of the Cornhusker Fly Fishers. Uh, he hosts the annual Cornhusker Carp Fest, although the name is a little bit to be determined, I think. Yeah, um, stay if you're into that, stay tuned. I'll be doing an announcement with that here soon. So, but Ooh, I, that's, I for another, we that's for another. I didn't topic. know we were breaking news on this thing. I, I, that's, well, that's we'll break. Exciting. We'll break. We'll break news later. That's just a tease. Just a little <laughs> okay. tease. Okay. okay. <laughs> so, Larry has been carp fishing for a long time, and uh, the way that we all kind of met was through the. Well, I met Dan in Madison in 2013, but um, we all met all together as well at uh, the Carpside Tournament in Minneapolis, which is a really cool place. And I see that Rick Fetzevong, I might be saying your name wrong, Rick, I'm sorry. Rick just joined. He will be helping uh, host Carpside this next year. So for people in the Midwest, stay tuned on that. Excellent. Uh, let's see. Um, we've recapped last season. Uh, people know who we are. My name's Luke. Uh, and so in this episode, we're going to talk about finding carp. Um, I, I entertained the idea of chatting about how our carp seasons were or talking about anything fun that we did this last year, carp fishing. Should we spend, let's spend five minutes tops chatting about fishing. Cause we, we didn't all see each other all together i saw larry this summer i didn't see you no i did see you dan we got we got yeah. lunch but that's right we did fish together this year so that's right how was everyone yeah season? How was yeah dan you go first okay oh, I'll, okay. Go, I'll go first it was you know it was it was a it was a good season um i have a i have like a two and a half year old now so that's like taking some of my fishing you know, taking my responsibilities and prioritized my time on the water. Um, but, uh, you know, I found some really good mulberry water. I got my dad on his first mulberry fish. That was really cool. Um, I got to take some new guys out to Lake McConaughey uh, in western Nebraska. And uh, Luke got to come out for our, um, Luke and maybe a couple of other folks that are beyond the chat tonight, got to go out for our Great Plains Bonefish Invitational. So that was a good time. It's a thing we do for Project Healing Waters. Um, and yeah, so that was, that was, you know, I, I got out and fished, I caught fish, I caught fish with Luke a couple times. Um, uh, I didn't get to hook up with Dan, but the, that'll change this next year. But, uh, you know, we have low and clear water in Omaha, you're right. You know, in, in, in Nebraska, we're in a drought. So, so fishing has been really good, you know, around here. Cart fishing, side fishing has been really good the last couple of years. That's all. So yeah, fishing has been great. It was great. I want to do it more. <laughs> <laughs> well i'm on the opposite end of the spectrum from larry because my two and a half year old just turned 19 and she moved into college uh this year so uh, uh once i got her moved out uh in mid-august i mean i fished before that and, and and quite a bit but uh once i got her moved out mid-august i kind of went fishing crazy and uh had the boat out a ton had a lot of people in from out of town in fact uh trevor mctag tanner uh who i fished with uh, as frequently as possible, but he's in California now, so it's not as frequently as I'd like. He made it out here with his dad. We spent three or four days on the flats boat. Um, uh, it was it was a great season, especially at the end, man. Big fish. Uh, like Larry said, shallow water. It was clear. Um, in fact, we had a lot of lake that you that the, that you, we had to stop fishing because the put-ins you couldn't put your boat in anymore. So the ones where you could still squeeze a boat in, you had a lot of a lot of shallow, clear water. Um, algae bloom was pretty good this year, so we were we're seeing fish, and um, yeah, it was a great it was a great year, man. It was awesome. So you did not have many algae blooms this year. No, they were much better than, well, you could kind of, there have been years when it's like everything's green and you're just in trouble for a month. Yep. Um, but, it, you know, we still had some bloom as we always get them, but you could kind of jump around and find clear water and some places didn't bloom. And so, yeah, it was it was better than it has been in a, in a while in terms of, of blooms. I think because a lot of those blooms are uh, the effect of agricultural runoff. Uh, and with the, the drought we had, we didn't have nearly as much runoff. So there wasn't as much uh, phosphates and nitrogen getting put directly into the lakes. So they didn't bloom. And, uh, um, and Boy, does that make for some good shallow water flats fishing. Sweet. Yeah, that's a good public service announcement to not fertilize your lawn and to, uh, if you have any influence on agriculture, to, uh, yeah, be careful of what you're putting on your fields. You run a buffer strip. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, all of that uh, stuff that, you know, 
TU and other conservation aid, you know, agencies talk about for trout, it all applies everywhere. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So it's good. What about you, Luke? We're going to get here about your season. Yeah, it was great. Like it was just a really good season. Um, uh, it was strange because at the Midwest, it was generally in a drought, but like for the most part, the bodies of water that I spend a lot of time on, they got kind of just hit with rain at just the right times. And it was just like a a really, really fun season, like a lot of really, uh, a lot of cool backwater stuff and being able to explore some new places uh, that panned out really well. Uh, mulberry season was great. Uh, <clears throat> Early season was it. Early season definitely came later than it has last few years. <laughs> the first time I got my boat out, I was pulling with uh, my buddy Nathan, and I was pulling up on this flat, and I was hitting bottom, and I was like, I don't remember this being rock. The the bo bottom of the flat was still frozen. <laughs> so we had had a cold. We had had a cold winter, and it froze all the way through the flat into the the substrate well into the substrate it would wow. seem and so Tund tundra flat, man God, tundra. Was, yep the flat ice was off the flat but the substrate <clears throat> was still frozen so that was bizarre it took a while for things to thaw out this year i'm guessing you didn't see any fish tailing on the uh, frozen bottom no. no no silt clouds either <laughs> <laughs> so yeah oh it was all good but well i mean that is a nice segue we're talking about finding carp and i did not find that carp uh, or did not find carp that day. But so uh, tonight, like, we all kind of have different water that we kind of specialize in. You know, I mean, I think we've all fished a lot of the same types of water, but we also kind of have our own, own wheelhouses. And so tonight we're going to talk about finding carp, uh, kind of the overview that I'll give everyone, just the large picture is um, Larry's going to spend some time talking about urban streams, rivers, lake and pond reservoir systems. Larry, is there anything that I'm missing that you really want to cover? No, I'll, I'll bring it up or, or somebody can ask questions too along this whole, this whole deal. So Dan, Dan's going to spend a bit more time talking about larger lake systems and, and natural lakes. Uh, and that Dan sound good. Anything yeah. I'm missing there? No, that sounds great. And then uh, I'll spend some time talking about river systems. Uh, and uh, the way I've got it currently laid out is uh, I was going to have Larry kind of kick us off with the urban fishing thing or just, you know, generally kind of fishing those Midwestern streams and, and other things. So, Larry, I'll let you take it away with finding carp. Well, and I would love to. And, and, and I'll just start it off. You know, I live in a city, and, may, and there's a good chance most of the folks watching this now or in the future, are they live in cities. And um, the really cool thing about carp is they tolerate and they thrive in human development and the wake of human development. They tolerate muddy, silty water. They can tolerate contaminated water they can tolerate extremes in oxygen and in water quality and in temperatures and uh, that's a good thing because uh, nearly every city as in the midwest for sure but coast to coast you know there's concrete everywhere which is an unnatural watershed and makes everything just flow into the low spots and to alleviate that you know flood concerns Pretty much every city in the United States has some sort of way to get water channelized and out and into reservoirs and help prevent flooding. Um, so I'm really well versed in that. Our, you know, I'm, I'm from Omaha, Nebraska, and our entire watershed has been developed essentially at this point. So every every little corner of the watershed has a reservoir that has a, a lake essentially. You know, depend you know depending on the size. You know, from 20 to 300 acres, give or take. And then there's channelized streams that run throughout this whole town um, of Omaha. But that's the same. There's towns all over Nebraska that have uh, flood control canals and channels. There's towns all over the entire country that have these. Iowa, Kansas, Texas, Louisiana, the places that I've been and fished, <laughs> um, uh, South Dakota. Anyway, agriculture and ur urban development you know, it, it drives up this need for storing and moving water. And with that, there's, you know, with water, you have standing water, you're going to have fish. And the fish that survives and, and, that, and human development is carp. And there are carp are in a lot of these bodies of water. 
Um, the nice thing about urban bodies of water is they're typically shallow. And like I like we kind of mentioned in our intro, like this, like these last couple of years where I live, it's been a drought year. So water's been low and it's been clear. It's been clear in, in, in nearly all of our flood control streams and creeks here um, where I fish anyway, which makes for exceptional fishing, exceptional carp fishing, exceptional sight fishing, and all the other species that come with it. Um, but if you are no located, if one of these canals is a tributary to a larger stream or river, um, the big ones around me are, is the Missouri River and then the Platte River that runs literally from Colorado and Wyoming across the entire state of Nebraska and dumps out south of Omaha into the Missouri. Um, any tributaries associated with those big bodies, those big rivers, um, that are flood control tributaries, they're going to have carp that swim up into them and are going to be accessible to anglers, um, especially shore anglers. Now, this, this is how I cut my teeth, the, the, the flood control creeks in, in, uh, in Nebraska. That's, that's where I learned how to fly fish for carp. Um, now, now, there's man-made impoundments. These are not natural rivers or natural reservo uh, reservoirs or lakes. They're literally parts of these flood control creeks that they dam up and this could be any city, again, in the United States. And it could be a hydroelectric little little dam. It could be anything like that. Those lakes like that, if they haven't been killed off by a conservation agency, um, they'll have carp in them. I mean, carp, carp have been around in this country since the late 1800s. And there's, there's pretty much not a, a state in the lower, you know, the lower 48 United States that doesn't have carp in them <laughs> that were either stocked intentionally or have just moved with humans um, through the years. Mm -hmm. And I would concentrate uh, on these, on these flood control, you know, reservoirs that are artificial. I would concentrate on the upper ends of these lakes. Now this is where creeks inflow into, into these reservoirs. And it's in, and t hopefully you have a nice marshy area or like some sort of miniature delta where there's lots of uh, emergent and submerged vegetation. You're talking cattails and reeds. And basically that's where the water filters into the lake. It's typically shallow and it's typically, you might have a little bit more visibility, but that's that shallow water is going to give you access to carp uh, regardless of the uh, water clarity. And, and, and they'll be there most of the year. Now, um, I don't have, a lot of experience seeing carp spawning in the canal, you know, the flood control canals. But, you know, you, you will witness it, but it's not like in the shallow lakes and reservoirs. Um, I just don't, I just don't see, I've fished a lot over the whole spawning period, you know, of late May all the way through July. You know, a lot of the canals, I don't see a lot of spawning action. All the, all the lakes that have, lakes and reservoirs that have carp, you see lots of fish shallow spawning. So anyway, that's just kind of a tidbit so, there, but uh, so so, Larry, I'm going to interrupt for a quick second. Yeah. Carp are broadcast spawners. So the female's just blowing eggs everywhere and the male's blowing silt everywhere. My, my, my presumption is that moving water kind of screws up that spawning ability when you're broadcasting. They kind of need everything to stay in the same area so that the fertilization can occur. So my experience is the same as yours, which is if it's moving water, I don't see the fish spawn. I mean, maybe like a backwater, you might get a little weird spawning activity, but they're trying to find as still a water as, as possible, in my opinion. And if that, and if they yeah. have access into a reservoir from the, directly from the stream, they're moving into it. Yeah, and unfortunately, I don't like where I live. We don't have a lot of access um, to streams that you know that have flowing water entering a, a lake that just doesn't really exist where I live. But places like Minneapolis, I mean, there's literally the Minnehaha Creek just goes through lakes and opens into them and floods out and then co comes back in. I mean, talk about like uh, ideal urban fishery to me. Like that's like the Minnehaha chain of lakes, you know, from Minnetonka all the way down to the Mississippi. I mean, that's like. I mean, you could spend a lifetime just fishing that, and it would be awesome. Um, but really, there's all, I mean, there's all across this country. I, I mean, I, I mentioned it. I've kind of fished the, the boot from South Dakota straight down, <laughs> and I fish like, from Nebraska east. And you could run into the same types of urban waters. I mean, you're t you know, ri rivers and creeks that run through any town, you, s you see you have a little slough that comes off it. You have some riprap or some, you know, a little cut or like a culvert that flows out. Man, there could be carp somewhere as long as you could legally get access. Now, the uh, 
the quick, you know, kind of bonus wild card you want to mention with urban fisheries is like neighborhood ponds and like golf course ponds or maybe like city parks. Now, depending on how uh, aggressive your, you know, state fisheries agency is on, on controlling carp populations, some of those might not have fish at all, like carp anyway. They could, you know, they might be awesome bluegill and bass fisheries and trout, like stock or trout. Um, but if they do have carp, so those urban lakes like that can be amazing. Luke. Uh, so Larry, I've got a question. And I, so like, especially talking about finding carp, so if you're dropping, say you've just flown into a city you've never fished before, you're like, I've got a day. I want to go try to find some carp. Say it's dotted with ponds here and there and stuff like, um, so I, I think that the thing that I, I'm getting at is maybe like the notion of connection and looking at what's connected to what you kind of talked about that with mini haha. Yeah. But what kind yeah. so like, um, I mean, even have, despite the fact that I just said that, you know, what kinds of things are you going to look for to pick, you know, maybe the first spot or two that you're going to go check to see if there's some carp? It would be, to me, it would be maybe a lake or a pond that's adjacent to a big river. I mean, there's a good chance in the history of that river being around that that pond is flooded, which means there's probably rough fish, AKA carp and buffalo and all the stuff that we like in that pond that that's a good that's a good starting point if you know literally nothing about where you're going um you know you could get, get really lucky it's like oh you got to lay over in like phoenix or something or you know down there in the southwest well they literally like stock koi and carp into those places um so you could get really lucky and like just go somewhere where they just have carp around in urban environments yeah so Larry, when 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 a, a municipality poisons out one of these ponds and, and clears out all the carp, um, after that, when you're illegally putting the carp back in, do you do it after dark or do you do it right in the middle of the day? <laughs> oh, uh, I no comment. I wouldn't know anything about that. Don't get caught doing that. You will be in a lot of trouble. <laughs> no, you don't want to do that. I, you don't want to do that. I mean, that that goes to show. I mean, you know, I live in a state that's really uh, aggressive about controlling carp and. It's unfortunate because some of the best urban fisheries for carp, there is one in northern Omaha that was legit. It was a, it was a place you could take a polling skiff and fish for carp. Well, it does, there's no carp in there anymore. There's no carp in that whole section of watershed, which is a, it's a bummer, I mean, to someone like me. Because really, carp are the everyman's game fish. I've, you know, we kind of all talked about that. But it's a, it's a big sport fish that is available to everybody and was brought over here as a food source for you know, Poseidon's sake, like, get out of here. Like, it's like, it's meant, we brought it over here on purpose to, to anyway, they're not going anywhere. Um, one, and then uh, if I had, if, if I was dropped into a city or somewhere and I had nothing but like a fly rod and like a couple hours to kill, what I would go is to like an urban tail race. Now it's where one of these lakes outflows and it might, it might even be just a 10 foot wide little, you know, concrete river rip rappy little creek that outspits into a into another creek and it might be i mean if you call that a tailwater you know somebody from colorado will just laugh at you but that's what that's it's just a mini tailwater i mean i i don't know i mean in the whole entire midwest i would guarantee you there's probably carp in one of those in those tailwaters and all of omaha or lincoln I know they're they're starting to like put concrete and fence these off now. First, again, I don't know what the reason is with the NRDs and the and the DNRs and all that stuff. Um, so public access is the is the thing we all got to kind of be focused on. If you're if you're talking urban fisheries, that's a we'll put a pin in that and save that for a later conversation. But uh, um, a mini a miniature a miniature tailwater out of an urban lake, I mean. I'm all over it. If I have a if I have just a couple hours to kill, I bet I could catch a carp in one of those. So I got a quick. I got a couple of questions. I'll, I'll just give them both to you, and you can run with both of them. Uh, first of all, um, sounds like uh, could talk talk about warm water discharges a little bit. Um, and, yeah, uh, yeah. And, and then the second topic is um, it seems that there's a theme you're working around here, which is visibility. Right. And so 
Talk about that as sort of a driving force in how you're selecting these urban locations. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, I'll, I'll start with that one first because that is that is actually super important. And I, I kind of mentioned again we we we've, we've been in a drought here the last couple of years in in the Midwest and Omaha specifically, um, which has meant low and clear streams pretty much the entire season, um, with the exception of like a big rain of a big thunderstorm that comes through and muddies it. But then it has been receding really quickly. A normal year. I would say in a, a general rule is these urban these urban creeks and canals, ones that are very channelized and not, you know, they're not maintained to break the current. Um, there's not a lot of current breaks at all in these. Man, when when it's seasonally, it can be unfishable for months on end. Um, and a wet, we, we've had wet years a couple of years back where literally you couldn't, it's chocolate milk in some of these urban creeks. Um, that might I mean, you know, you need to focus on the reservoirs because, you know, a, a high reservoir can push carp into structure where that's accessible from shore. Um, again, in that upper level, you know, that upper end of the lakes, you know, where there's, where there's, you know, where the water is coming in that, that's where I would focus or the outflow of those lakes, you know, the, t the mini tailwaters. Um, but yeah, uh, you're at the winds of mother nature and then your and then whatever development is going on if they're building a new subdivision on the upper end of whatever watershed that you happen to be fishing on and you get a little bit of rain i mean that your canal could be mudded out for i mean as long as you got high water which is again uh, unfortunate but that's just the that's just part of living in an urban environment you're you know you're in a concrete jungle and you're dealing with that slip and slide it, now it, oh go ahead yeah well, can, no, I was well say, can I add a comment to just like when things are a little yeah. bit muddy? So I think one theme that is probably going to be uh, throughout what I talk about too, but I know I've seen with you fishing with you um, is like, like uh, so there's literal, there's access issues regarding like, is this public access and things like that? But then there's also access issues in terms of like, I know there's carp in here, but I can't see it. I can't, you, like, that's like a, a secondary access issue. And I remember one time fishing, uh, like, at Urban Creek with you, uh, one of your local ones, and it was muddy. Like, it was definitely abnormally muddy that time. And um, I remember getting to a spot where I was like, well, I'm not going to be able to see them most places, but this is a, this is a little eddy where I can see, where I can tell it's not too deep. And maybe if I hang out here for a little while, I'll see a carp cruise in. And I did, I don't think I caught that fish, but, but I did, but like, like a carp did show up, which is something that um, I guess I'm just curious uh, if there's any more of your thoughts on that in terms of like, oh, just accessing fish when maybe the conditions are a little more adverse or like, say someone gets to one of those urban tail races and maybe it's one with quite a bit of current and at first glance you know there aren't really any fish to be seen like you know i guess what would you tell somebody like uh, what advice would you give someone for how to deal with that I, my advice would be get if you could get closer to a like a tail race or uh, uh like a low head dam or some some kind of eddy or current break um, that's going to be a good starting point. Like, the, the, like really, there's nothing worse than like muddy water, but then like muddy high water, because that like oh. this link, it just it just link, it just the, the whole the whole uh, you know the whole where you can see carp is just stretched out so much. I mean, you can deal with muddy water when it's when it's a foot deep because you'll see the carp's tails out of the water, so you can you can deal with that. I mean, there's not a, there's not a huge substitute for like kind of like knowing your water and knowing some spots even when it's muddy it's like oh this is a shallower spot that there may be carp at um i mean my my best advice is is if you're dealing with like muddy water i mean if all you have is muddy water man that that's it's going to be tough for you to try to catch carp especially if you're a beginner um the, the, I, the two I, things you can the, and, and larry you hit them but the two things you can do to combat muddy water and, and, and it is uh, like Larry said, you got to find shallow water, right? Because it's not, this is a con, there's an interplay between water clarity and depth. And I don't care how clear it is, if it's too deep, it, 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 there'll be a depth where you can't see, right? So there's an interplay there. So shallow, but the second thing, and I know Larry's a master at this, because I've seen his fishing on the canals, uh, elevation of the angler. Uh, it changes your 
uh, angle that you're looking into the water narrows your angle and you can see deeper even in muddy water if you get good elevation so uh, some of those canals that Larry's talking about have nice steep uh, concrete sides where the angler can be nice and elevated I I'm I'm sure and I know for myself but I'm sure Larry's the same way if, if it was muddy I would be heading to places where I have elevation rather than someplace where I was wading up to my knees just because of the angle that I'm looking into the water the depth that that's going to give me yeah that's that's right on i mean i would if if you know i mean if you're familiar with like a, a good milk run of spots or water you know if it's muddy water you, you you skip the spots that are deep concentrate on shallow stuff concentrate on weed edges and stuff like that um and i would i would you know maybe skip the canals and then maybe look for high muddy reservoirs and go back into the weeds you know go to the upper ends of of your uh your flood control creeks and stuff um uh, real quick, just because Dan mentioned it, you know, warm water discharge. The interesting thing about, you know, urban canal carp fishing is those deep spots, which might be muddy and high water events, those, like, could hold carp in the winter. And you can, if you're inclined, you know, do, like, Euro-style high-stick nymphing into those deep pools. And, you you know, if you catch catfish, you can catch creek chubs, you can catch carp doing that. Um, warm water discharge, which there are some actually available by boat anglers uh, on like the Missouri around here. Um, you know, there could be any, you, you name it, there, those fish are there. You know, depending on the type of discharge and the type of flow rates and that, I mean, you could probably do some sight fishing for carp. I personally have never done it just because I just haven't taken the time to do that. Um, but I know there's guys that do that around the Great Lakes. I know there's, I mean, that's a, it's a, that's a legit fishery. Um, I, I've never personally done it and I would, I mean, it sounds fun to me. I mean, there's nothing better than when it's 20 degrees out and going to catch a big fish. That'd be cool. <laughs> hey, hey, Larry, um, we should probably move on to Dan here in a minute. Uh, one thing that Rick, uh, asked was, uh, indicator like bobber fishing for carp. You kind of address that talking about Euro stuff but i know you've done a little bit of indicator stuff can you maybe talk about some of your experience with that or like some of your knowledge and dan if you know yeah um uh there is a pond you know uh, the indicator fishing i've done is when there's like schools and a lot of small fish that's how i've done it anyway and i've literally just suspended a, a nymph below an indicator and just drifted it through the wind it was a really super windy day this is the day i had one of the best days i've had doing this and i knew there were carp tailing around and moving around in like this this ledge and uh, side fishing to those was literally it was just wasn't going to happen on this this day but i just drifted like you would under an indicator a heavy this a heavy hair's ear essentially and i caught several nice carp doing that um i mean it's not something i do all the time but if you know i mean if you know that there are carp in a body of water they be, they can behave just like a brown trout they'll hang out in eddies and current breaks and wait for things to drift by them um you've done a little bit i know we're, we're going to talk about presentation more i think in another episode but yeah. like that it's a viable thing it's a definitely a viable thing during mulberry season i mean luke yeah. and i have deployed that you know dry dropper thing to deadly effect um yeah, but yeah i mean it's, so it's it's viable i i mean i it wouldn't be the first thing i would do just because i'm like the sight fishing aspect is like the whole thing to me yeah really for carp fishing but it's viable and there's there's no um greg martin i think is the guy that you know the old guy on the fly carping forums and stuff man he uh he, that's what he did that's all the way he fished was just under uh, an egg underneath an indicator and that that dude slayed yeah no, so no, he, and and it, just like in larry's situations greg uh and i would i would i would back this up but um if you're gonna fish with an indicator you got to know the fish are there um, they're not going to find it, right? You really got to be drifting it to a fish, just like you would with a, a brown or something. Uh, Greg was a master at looking at like bubble trails and little tiny indications to think that, to know that there was a carp down there and that he was putting that egg in front of, like Larry's talking about group of a bunch of fish. Um, and, and you're in a situation where you know you're drifting through fish, that's great. If you're just going out to like a muddy canal and, and that you know generally has carp and trying to dead drift with, a, with an indicator, you're probably going to have a pretty long day. You really want to know you're putting it in front of the face of a lot of, a lot of fish because it's still effectively a sight fishing game at the end of the day that just aren't going to move far to find. They're not hunting for, for, for little nymphs or anything like that. Yep, yep. 
Cool. Well, well hey, should, uh, so well, actually, to summarize kind of Larry's thing, so, I mean, Larry, some things that you talked about were, uh, like, if you're looking at uh, uh, small pond, like urban ponds or um, small uh, bodies of still water, you talked about, like, uh, proximity to a larger river system or to another body of water that you're, you're pretty sure has carp. Um, you talked about, like, urban streams or uh, systems where it's uh, maybe like a river or a small stream that goes through a series of lakes, uh, like um, importance of uh, the entry point to lakes being like shallow delta -y areas to find fish. Um, so those were just the, kind of some of the themes. Anything else? You know, sh sh shallow weeds, I mean, uh, uh, again, we're all going to kind of mention this, like the, go the Google Earth, you know, aerial image searching, looking for areas that are, have cattails and the edges of those areas, or yep. cattails, reeds, yep. you know, phragmites, whatever, you, whatever your local emergent vegetation is on your body of water, that's a good place to look for carp. And luckily, urban fisheries have a lot of those, so... All right. Uh, all right. So let's uh, move on to talking about a little bit bigger bodies of water than uh, just bigger still water, natural lakes, stuff like that. This is what uh, I mean, Dan, you've done it all, but this is what you've spent a lot more time doing in the last few years. Um, so, yeah, I'll let, you, I'll let you just uh, take it away. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I know both of you guys have uh, shown up and taken apart some of these natural lakes in South Dakota to so chime in, right, boys, because you know as much about this as I do. But um, um, I would suggest that I'm going to break the thinking down a little bit along the same lines Larry did. And the first thing I'm thinking about is this depth to clarity ratio, right? And and that is the more clear, I, uh, the, the clearer the body of water that I'm fishing at the time, the deeper I can handle and be able to, uh, to find fish. So let's assume that I'm looking at a body of water and it's kind of muddy. It's got, I don't have a lot of clarity. I'm really thinking hard about what Larry just ended with. Where can I get to uh, shallow, shallow water? And, and a lot of indications of shallow water is emergent veg vegetation, right? It's shallow enough that you've got this vegetation emerging. And so you can get up in reeds. It does two things. It, it stops on the still water, especially big bodies of water. A lot of your muddiness comes from churn from the wind, especially up here in, in South Dakota, where the wind starts in Wyoming and doesn't stop until Minneapolis because um, we got that one tree uh, it, it, near Mitchell, <laughs> but that's it. Um, there, uh, uh, that's what causes a lot of our, of our visibility issues is churn. So when I can get back into or behind some vegetation that creates a line that slows that churn down, I can usually find clear water, clearer water around there. And at least if I'm not finding clearer water, I'm finding shallow water. And that means I may get, you know, backs or tails, or I don't have to see through as much water to find the fish. So I'm thinking about that clarity to depth ratio. And if it's, if I have a lot of clarity, I might be willing to move out farther from these sort of margins and get into some deeper water because I might be able to see fish in two, three, four feet of water, um, or they may be suspended mid-column and I can get after them in that, in that depth of water. Um, and they're there all the time. It's just that I can't see them and, and sight cast to them if I don't have some clarity. So I'm thinking a lot about depth. And a few of the ways that I attack the what depth is the water going to be question on a big body of water is, you know, uh, satellite images of, uh, of lakes is critical. And there's a few things I'm, I'm checking for. One, the topography of the ground around the lake is oftentimes reflected along the shoreline, right? Meaning if you're looking at something that's got a steep hill, as it enters the water, it's probably going to reach depths relatively quickly. But if you have a shallow gradient into the water, it's very likely that you're going to have a shallow gradient once it's under the water. So if you're looking for a flat, you really want to look for, you know, ground that's flat that that then what that then you know water has creeped up on because you probably have a flat underneath it and and uh, so i'm focusing in on using my satellite images on areas where the topography right along the shoreline uh looks like what i want the depth that i'm looking for in in the water um and usually that's that's relatively shallow water but uh but not always um 
the second thing I'm looking at is sort of the structure of the land. So bays, like shall, like bat, like bay, uh, uh, um, or sandy. Well, not uh, sandy is not the right word, but sort of protected areas where you're getting some cove kind of action can oftentimes be be shallow flats or have wide shallow margins. So maybe you've only got a 20 foot shallow ledge. But if you're in a small bay where it loops all the way around, you've got a lot of fishable water then in that along the circumference of that bay. Whereas if it's just a straight line, uh, you, you're not getting nearly as much fishable water. Um, so I'm looking for things like uh, uh, I'm looking for things like um, uh, you know bays or coves, um, something with protected fingers. And once again, it does two things. A, it helps that wave action keep the muddiness in that area down, and B, it probably indicates some shallow, some shallower areas if that's what I'm looking for. Another thing I'm looking for up here, and I know I'm not the only one who deals with this, is algae blooms can just kill my fishing, right? I could get great water clarity. It's sun's high. We've, got, we've had no wind for three days. It should be a stellar day. The lake turns green, and I'm screwed. So on these bigger bodies of water, I'm thinking a lot about wind in that case and where direction the wind is coming out of or it's come out of recently. Because if unless the entire body blooms, which is very rare, that algae will usually stack up on the downwind side of the lake, right? So if I can get to the upwind side of the lake and find some of these shallow or uh, uh, flat, flatty areas, I can maybe still find some clarity or at least the, the, the bloom will be a lot thinner and, and you'll be able to see through it a lot more in those in those areas. So I'm thinking a lot about wind direction. Um, another place, and this Larry was talking about this a little bit with with the reservoirs. When you're looking for that kind of those so shallower flats, uh, the inlets to these lakes or wherever whatever's feeding them, the where the water's coming from, is oftentimes a wide flat area. So the water will come in through some type of a channel, and then it'll start to spread out when it gets to this lake, which is what makes the lake right. And so you'll have this like shallow flat at the front end. The bad part is. It's carrying sediment, so it's probably the muddier end of the lake. But the good news is it may have 7,000 carp stacked up in it, right? So you can at least spend all day whaling away at them. Um, so so that you'll find shallows at the, at the front ends of those, uh, of those lakes, and that can help offset your visibility problems. When I have good visibility and I have a lot of depth I can deal with, I really, really like uh, rocky shorelines with reed with weed lines uh, uh, out in some depth of water, underwater weed lines. Yeah, I think the car can gain a lot of access to food in those those weed lines, and I catch a lot of of mid column fish. I call them, but you know, fish that are two, three feet below the surface in maybe ten feet of water. I can't see the bottom but I can see three or four feet down and I'll find fish cruising along the edges of those weed lines. Um, that can be a really productive place to look for fish. And if you happen to be adjacent to some, it won't be a huge usually, but some moderately shallow, flat, rocky flat of some type, they'll move up onto those to, to feed sometimes too, and then back to the weeds for protection and, and for some depth. So I like the weed lines. Um, but, uh, um, but again, I'm thinking about, uh, uh, I'm thinking about that's a, a, again a factor of visibility and then topography that's available around it. <laughs> One other factor that I, I, I yeah, go for it, Larry. What do you got? Oh, I was just gonna I was just gonna chime in real quick. You know, we're all gonna kind of touch on the same you know t the same endpoint, which is like shallow water, typically where you could see your fish. And Dan mentioned looking at you know t uh, you know topographic maps or aerial maps. The cool thing about Google Earth is you can click up on the top. There's like a little clock indicator, and you can literally wind the clock back wherever wherever you're zoomed in. And from year to year, you can see maybe like the seasonal fluctuations of water, and you know see where the weeds emerge and, and die off every year. And that can give you you know you know a, a t it can get your wheels turning for the different seasons. Anyway, I just wanted to chime that, that in. Is, that is a perfect segue because the, the next thing I was going to talk about is the reservoir effect. They call it new reservoir effect. Um, and the clock is, is on your on your Google uh, images is critical to this. So there's this effect that they know about, which is that when we build a new reservoir, we flood this area out. 
these reservoirs grow monster fish right away. And then eventually there's a crash and then things normalize and you get normal size, normal homeostatic populations of normal sized fish. But for a period of time, you have more fish than is normal and giant fish. And the reason is you're flooding all of this new rich ground constantly when that happens. Well, the same goes for when carp are looking to feed. Water, ground that is exposed some of the year, most of the year, or was for the last 20 years or whatever, but that becomes flooded is super rich in food source and nutrients and all kinds of stuff, and it is like a, an attractant to these carp. A, those fresh new, a brand new body of water will grow monster fish or a body of water that's continually growing, which we have up here. Um, uh, but, but even beyond that, even a body of water that just swells and, and shrinks and swells and shrinks, when it swells and you, that newly flooded grass, or up here it's grass, but that newly flooded ground is just dense with food sources. One of my favorite days fishing of all time was when Larry and I fished the, the, uh, on McConaughey in the flooded, uh, and it flooded uh, a forest effectively. The, the, the sheer number of carp was astronomical. The tonnage of carp in that front end was astronomical. Every fish in the lake was up there eating right off these logs. And, and so the flooded areas can be something to really focus on. In my local lakes, we get a lot of raising and swelling based on how much snow did we have the year before, how much rain have we had around in the spring, are we in a drought, like they can really move. And some of our major lake systems here will flood parts of pastures and then it'll recede or it'll flood. And when those are flooded and, they're, and up in the grass, A, once again, you're slowing down some of that wave action, B, um, you, get, you usually have some, some shallow water, but see, you also have a hyper-rich uh, environment uh, for the most part, and you can just collect tons of fish. I saw that uh, uh, Will Sanchez was on here uh, a second ago. I hope he still is because he's a killer carp fisherman. But him and I took my flat skiff out. He showed me a spot this year, um, and we were in some flooded back areas that you could have walked across the carp. In fact, Leo left off the boat trying to catch him out of the grass, uh, and we had to swim him out to deep water to get the mud off him and throw him back in the boat. But moral of the story is there were fish everywhere. There were fish in that whole lake, but back in that back bay, that, that fresh flooded area, man, it was just, it, it just can be killer. Uh, you do give up some visibility oftentimes in those flooded areas. They can get kind of muddy and stuff, but you got a, you got a number of shots and you got shallow water, so you usually can make up for it uh, in, in that case. Um, the one other part I will talk about, because it's a little bit of a different scenario, but uh, there's a, oftentimes we will run into fish uh, when we're fishing these shallow waters that have come to the surface for some reason to feed. And uh, there'll be a rat, you'll see rafts of carp up on the surface feeding. And there'll be either, either stuff that's being blown across the surface of the lake or uh, 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 some type of a mayfly hatch happening or something. In those cases, where I tend to find them, and I'm not a super expert on this, but where I tend to find them are like uh, along riprap areas where the water will go from like the highway to like 20 feet really quickly, and but you've got this this shallow water, there's really deep water that is uh, close to shore. We can find rafts of fish or fish just below the surface that come up in groups and start to feed oftentimes. Um, uh, around flooded vegetation, you'll see you'll see rafts of fish. Sometimes it's as simple. It reminds me of salt. All of the style of fishing I do is effectively like saltwater fishing, but it reminds me of like cobia fishing, which I've done in South Carolina with Tuck Scott. Um, you stand on the top, you stand in the front of the boat, and you just look out, and you'll see dark spots on the on the surface where they're moving across in these groups, and you're going to go out and cast to them. So there are times to check deep water. I tend to try to check again topography where the water gets deep quickly in those instances um uh you, you just never you're not going to be sight fishing to fish on the bottom you're going to be throwing to fish that are on the surface or, or just barely subsurface in those kind in those cases it's counterintuitive you're you're over deep water but you're fishing on the surface and so it's kind of a weird thing but that's i mean that's the big i would say not like urban reservoirs but the big flood control reservoirs that i've fished i mean that's definitely a thing i mean You've seen all kinds of uh, fancy fly fishing films that show that same type of, uh, you know, on big reservoirs out west, same type of deal, you know, clooping fish up high um, on, the faces, on the faces of riprap man-made dams. It's a, it's a thing that carp end up doing probably because there's something with the way that water quality is on these dams. Or it's really good for bug life. 
Yeah. It may uplift yeah. bug life or something. I don't really understand it, but it is where I where I tend to see them. Um, and I think it's the same uh, where you guys are. Um, hey, hey, Dan, can I ask a question? And I think this is a, well, this is sort of like a, maybe just a topic that I think is important regardless of what type of system someone is in. But um, one thing we haven't really talked about, we I mean, so we've talked about knowing or suspecting whether or not carp are there. We've talked about the importance of like, like even if you're sort of blind fishing, knowing that you pretty much know exactly where a fish is. Uh, one thing we haven't talked about yet is like population density. Uh, so like oh, yeah. when we're like learning new water, scouting new water, um, out on, you know, say you're out in a boat on a lake for the first time, which I know I've done that with Larry, where we're just like, well, we're here. Uh, <laughs> you know, check it out. <laughs> based on what we've seen, these two kind of seem like some places to go, but like, so Dan, like for, for bigger lakes and stuff, um, when people are navigating that whole, I, I guess I'm hoping we can speak to a couple of things. One, uh, I hope people understand we've spent a lot of days getting blanked because we're just figuring stuff out. Like you go to no, some Larry, Larry, Larry doesn't, Larry doesn't get blanked. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you go to some yeah. places and you know it's just not happening or yeah. the conditions aren't right or you know something like that so uh, maybe for like some of the bigger natural lakes uh what, what's kind of been your experience and maybe some things that you found important when it comes to finding fish and finding the right density of population and stuff like that excellent question uh bow fishing forums help a lot um, bow fishing forums are a great source of information on where the carp are. Um, I wouldn't go to the exact flats that the bow fishermen are shooting them up because they are spooky. But uh, it will tell you if that body of water holds fish. It give you some idea of general size of fish. Don't believe their estimates if they're not weighing them because nobody shoots no, a forty pound yeah, carp. Look for the brag boards too. I mean, that gives, <laughs> like where they have the twenty pounders lined up it's like okay there's big fish in that whatever that was that's i mean that's a legit way to look for big fish anyway absolutely absolutely um uh the other things about density are you know larry mentioned the spawn um when you carp will show themselves a couple of times a year usually or once a year that sometimes you get a second spawn um and they'll get up in the shallows and they'll start spawning and they'll splash it up and they'll cause all kinds of mayhem um just log in your brain. Hey, there's a big spawn on that lake. That lake must hold a bunch of fish, or that corner of that lake holds a bunch of fish. They do tend to be relatively sort of regional. Is that a word to use in a lake? I don't know, but they'll kind of tend towards the same area of the lake, right? So um, uh, if this flat holds a population of fish, I know that they do move around some, but I, I believe it's the same general population of fish that are staying in that corner. They're spawning there, they're feeding there, assuming they got everything that they need. So uh, look for spawning behavior early in the spring, which, you know, I don't know what it is where you are, Larry, where I am, we're talking about um, May-ish, mid-May-ish is when the spawn sort of starts to happen. Um, yeah, it's really a water day. temperature thing. Yeah, Memorial Day is a good uh, good bellwether. I mean, I mean, I, you can there's there's spawning somewhere over Memorial Day weekend here. Um, common carp are anyway. Um, yeah. You know, all through maybe that second week of June. I know we did. Uh, I know carpicide went on one year, and uh, Chris, who I think it was logged in here a little bit, we went and fished a lake. All of the A spots, carp, all every carp on the lake was spawning in that day. But we ended up finding playing fish on a total kind of the other side of the lake at another inlet creek. So even if all the fish are spawning too, you know, again, we've talked about this, you can catch some of those fish first off. If there's some wallflowers hanging around, that's what, you know, Trevor Tanner called them. Um, but, you know, they're not, you know, uh, that tells you that the fish are there and, and hopefully there's some are jumping and you could get a good look at a couple. You can gauge their size. Oh, it's, you know, this, this lake's worth coming to, and this is worth investing my time, you know, learning how to fish this lake. If you see some big, you know, 10, 15, 20 pounds, big old females jumping. So, yeah, spawning is a cool, is that's that's the way I would recommend, you know, it's just hit the water, you know, that prime season, you know, late May, early June. Yeah. Dan, what kind yeah, of, you'll know. The other thing, I'll, oh, go ahead. The other thing okay. I'll say real quick, real quick luke but about de uh, density population density is um uh 
you're going to have to kind of go look at the at the body of water to get an idea of if it holds carp. But you can find on each individual body of water areas that hold them in higher densities than other areas. And that's where I go back to that like newly flooded uh, ground. That's going to concentrate fish. Um, uh, where I'm, I'm looking for maybe some softer bodies. Bottoms tend to concentrate fish, re, the weeds, the weed stands, like Larry talked about, the where you're getting like Phragmites or something growing. That'll tend to concentrate fish because there has it has a lot of bug life going on in the bottom. Um, so, so really, it's not. It, 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 uh, when I'm looking for what lakes to go to, it's kind of that, you know, bowfisher forum, or wait for the spawn and see if there's fish there, do some scouting kind of stuff to, to, to identify the, the which body of water. But then once I've identified this is the body of water I'm going to, then it's more about, like I said, the, gr the flooded ground or the topography or whatever to try to figure out on that body of water, where are what, how, whatever fish are in there, where are they going to be concentrated? Um, and that, that tends to narrow the spot down relatively significantly yeah 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 i know what there's one uh time i'm thinking of in particular larry and i were on like a system of interconnected lakes and we were poking around a lot of them had really good clarity and we found some fish and they were a bit they were tough fish though they were pretty spooky there was a lot of boat traffic in the area they probably got bow fish too i don't know oh so yeah we're a little time. tougher um, but then we ended Carson up, still hooked, hooked a big one, though. I remember that. Yes. <laughs> and then we ended up finding this. I mean, go, I think speaks to exactly your point here, Dan, that, you know, the, we, we still hadn't gotten to this one spot that we had sort of picked out on Google Earth as like, a, you know, if we're not finding them anywhere else, we definitely need to try here. It didn't have the clarity, but it was it was this massive, shallow, flat uh, ringed entirely in cattails. So now that isn't super, super useful for maybe all the people, like uh, everybody that's just on foot, but um, it's also, it's super important to note that if you are checking out some water like that, where maybe there's a bunch of cattails, there's usually gaps in the cattails somewhere. Um, oh yeah. Try wading through it. You might be able to wade. You might be able to get through the cattails and wade. You also might not. Be careful. You don't want to sink too far in silt. Um, but I found like a lot of the time, just like when, if there's like a bay with cattail ringed in cattails, as long as there, as long as it isn't too like thick of a fence of cattails, that you can kind of poke between them and, and find them. But yeah, I think. So, yeah. So. We'll most of the stuff, everything I, I've, I've talked about with uh, the, looking at the bay for bays and topography and all that stuff, that's all stuff I did before I had my skiff too, and it was on, on yep. foot. Yep. And I actually also look for uh, public land adjacent to water. So now you layer on another thing here, right? How about some public ground that has the topography I'm looking for that uh, um, <laughs> forbidden corn dogs, that's funny. <laughs> Um, uh, that has the topography I'm looking for that, you know, into the, a bay of a lake, that's ground. I'm going to go, you know, park on the other end of walk a mile across if I need to, to, to go wade that flat. Um, I may or may not be able to wade it. That's one of the treacherous parts about carp fishing is some of the best water because of the mud bottoms are so soft. It, you can't really, it's tough to wade, but you'll find soft bottom or, or sand bottoms oftentimes, or even staying on the bank in those cases can be fine uh, you're not going to get to every fish but you'll you'll get to plenty of them that are tailing within you know a 20 30 40 foot cast uh um in, in some of those shallower areas and it, and it can like i said it can give you more square footage to fish if you've got something that is like a got a finger or is a bay or is, is a loop without having to you know walk six seven eight miles yeah yeah no i that's a good point because I know one thing that we talked about is like we all do have boats, but we also have spent a lot of time on foot chasing carp, and really all, a lot of the same principles apply. And I think sometimes hey, and to, being, go ahead. to this day, hey, I will get to spots where I beach my boat, get out and wade it because it's better and easier. I can get around it better. So sometimes the foot's the way to go, and sometimes it isn't the way to go. We I remember we had a couple of years ago. I had. Uh, a couple of people on the boat uh, had come out from West River. They were a really fun couple of ladies that came. And uh, we got to a point on a lake you guys have fished before where um, 
we had chains of fish coming down the bank and it was easier for us to beach that boat, get out, hide behind some blowdown that was there and let those fish come past us rather than try to hold the boat up in the right spot and, and, and make the cast and circle back around. And we had a fishing it on foot and, and, and taking the place apart. So um, sometimes the boat or the fish, the, the, the wading wade fishing is, is much more effective. It just, for me, it just depends on the bottom. Really, if I can get it, if I if the bottoms get so soft around here that uh, a guy could just about disappear, it feels like yeah. sometimes. I, yeah. Right. yeah, the urban, urban fisheries typically, you know, those the flooding canals. I mean, it is it is more conducive. I mean, of course, the, the canals you can't get a boat on those anyway. But I mean, that's I mean that's where I cut my teeth. I mean, geez, once I got my boat, I gained fifteen pounds just because I don't. I don't walk around as much anymore, you know. So, but that's, but uh, but you know, I I, I fish the same the lakes that I've taken my boat to and done well. A bunch of them, even in South Dakota or even natural lakes, I've t I've wade fished those, you know, my entire life. I mean, I I very late in my life have got a watercraft that can take me to to new to new parts of water. So that's funny. I mean, this doesn't, you know, it's it's not a boat only game. No. On, it, not by any means. Yeah, yeah. No. It's funny. It's though. just I a reason it. to get people out in the water with you. That's all. That's all a boat is, which is yep. you know a different. I thing. <laughs> lost fifteen pounds when I got my boat standing up pushing that damn pole so other people could fish. Yeah. Yeah, you you have a bigger boat than me, though. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, Dan, any closing thoughts or anything that you maybe didn't mention or want to summarize about, like, lakes and bigger bodies of water before we move on to river systems? Uh, yeah, yeah, one other thing. Water temperature differentials. So uh, you do not have consistent water temperatures on a, on a lake. Uh, it's colder below a certain point. It's colder in deep water. It's warm in shallow water. So uh, to, uh, the, the color of the bottom, believe it or not, especially early and late in the year, the color of the bottom makes a significant difference. You have a dark bottom. In, I fished into October this year up here in South Dakota. You have a dark bottom on a sunny day. It's going to be five, ten degrees warmer in that bay than it is elsewhere. That's an attractive fish. So, uh, particularly at the, on the shoulders of the season, but it doesn't have to necessarily be the shoulders of the season. Um, uh, think about water temperature differentials. As shallow water warms up faster in the sun, it cools off faster uh, w when the sun goes down. Uh, it doesn't have as much consistent temperatures, um, and so. It can be two things to think about. Early and late in the season, you want dark bottom, shallow areas, catching a lot of light, getting a lot of radiant heat, warming up faster. Later in the year or middle of the season when it's real hot. See, carp are actually not a hot water fish. They're a cool water fish, like a pike. So they would prefer to be in cool water temperatures. The, the, the body water they evolved in doesn't get over 70 degrees, period. So, um, so in, in when the water temperature gets real high, I try to make sure I have access to deep, cool water for those fish. They're going to still need to come in the shallows to feed. They can tolerate it. They're fine. But they will go back down into the depths to cool, to get into cool, more oxygenated water uh, uh, during the course of the day. So when it's warm, look for access to deep water. And when it's uh, cool outside, you're looking for uh, uh, bottoms or, bo or, or pockets of water that are going to uh, warm up quicker. I think that that is like a really great transition to talking about systems or river systems. Uh, Cause like, those are things that I, I know every, every, every year. So um, I think one of the first interesting things is, is temperature. And I know a lot of people kind of think uh, along the lines of I'm going to fish for carp when it's so hot i can't fish for trout or musky or any other species i will tell you when the i mean in my experience on the water i've fished when the water is over 80 the carp don't like it either they don't fight as hard they uh you'll find fish that are active in shallow water but they are not the biggest fish always um a lot of the biggest fish tend to like for me tend to move off like so on like a big river system tend to move off flats and i think they're largely in it's, if it's a bigger river in the river channel for a lot of the year mm -hmm. um anyways that's just an interesting temperature observation where i've noted just that kind of thing where a lot of us think oh it's too hot to fish for anything but carp so i'm gonna go fish for carp you're missing out on 
probably all the best carp fishing. If, if that's the only time you're fishing for carp, I will tell you, you're missing out on a ton. Um, you're, you're still going to be able to catch carp. That is the beauty of carp. And you can fish for them, and you don't have to feel bad. So that is the beauty of it, but you're missing out on some stuff. Um, when do you start your season? What's that? Sorry. When, when do you typically start your season? Yeah, so that's a good question. That kind of is where my mind was going, where Dan was talking about uh, the color of the bottom. Uh, th these are the terms that me and uh, our mutual friend here, uh, Carson, have termed uh, the importance of depth and dark in the early uh, parts <laughs> of the season. <laughs> uh, well, so like, you know, when, when ice out happens, um, uh, I, I generally am looking at river systems that have uh, like a decent number of backwaters, um, which, uh, you know, it, every river is just different and there can be parts of, there can be a stretch of a river that has a lot of backwaters and there can be stretches of river that just don't really have a ton of backwaters. Um, uh, ice out on backwaters, I, I have found Dan's point to be 100% accurate where it, there is kind of an ideal depth, it seems like, and they like the darkest, siltiest parts of that backwater. Um, and I, th I think like the, the, uh, the darkness uh, plays not only a temperature role, but I think that's all, I, I had a really hard time not saying dark, uh, uh, <laughs> plays not only a temperature role, but also I think that's just like the kind of bottom that they're looking for in a lot of cases too. Like, really detritus -y stuff like they seem to love that stuff in the early season um yeah that's so, soft that real soft benthos with a lot of muck that they can really get yeah. into yeah i think i think they're rich too yeah just rich yeah i think it's just like it's it's got to be multifactorial because um you know i think they like that stuff even when it's not cool out so that's where the i mean that's the most active you know food and ingredient is there it's midge larva is what's there yeah. that's i mean that's def that's i mean that's what you know to take just a clue from ice fishermen you know that's that's where uh the, the food chain is starting it's on these these shallow muddy flats that have midge larva bloodworms as some would call them all through the whole winter that's what all of the food chain is eating carp are there because they're eating they're they're actually Activating their metabolism, that warmer waters, get, you know, revving them up, and then they're eating the food source that's in that. Anyway, yeah. Sorry, continue there. No, no, no super great point. <laughs> super great. I, I like I like when Larry makes a really intelligent point and then says sorry. Yeah, yeah. I know. I'm like Larry. I wasn't. <laughs> that wasn't going to be one of my contributions to it. So uh, everybody's better for having heard you there, not me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so You're sorry. Welcome. I said something worthwhile. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here I'm just gonna I'm gonna reel things back just a little bit. Um, so uh, I think like when talking about river systems, it's really important to think about whether you're on a system that has a lot of backwaters that carp can have access to, uh, versus a river system that doesn't really have backwaters. Um, and then sort of related, but regardless of those two factors, is thinking about um, current speed and uh you know you might have a river that's overall slower or you might have a river that's uh that has quite a bit of current uh so like with the large systems that's kind of those situations where i'm talking about like finding fish on the flats like after ice out a after the the bottom has thawed also if it's a winter that was so cold that the the bottom of the flat thawed but yeah, the uh, the backwaters play like a big role in the early season, in my experience. And then as long as there's water on them, they're probably going to hold fish all summer long as well. Um, uh, it, it seems like they kind of start to get off of those flats when it's cooling down. So they're sort of like an opposite effect, you know, like uh, the water is, you know, getting into the high 30s and stuff in the spring that means fish are pushing up onto it you know and getting up there getting ready for spring and everything whereas in the fall it's like once the water temp uh you know starts getting lower they're doing the opposite thing uh and they're they're probably starting to leave some of that stuff 
for for the uh, you know safety of the deeper channel. Um, it, even with a, a a system with a lot of backwaters, though, um, it it depends on the density, but you're still going to find fish all up and down it. So like a big slow river uh, with lots of backwaters, lots of cattails, it's probably going to be pretty high density. There's probably just going to be a lot of fish in there unless there have been monumental efforts to, to keep the carp out and to kill them. And even if there have been some pretty significant efforts to kill them or keep them out, uh, there's probably going to be a high density of carp. And so whether you're on foot or in a boat, take your time. You're probably going to anywhere where it's shallow enough for you to see the fish or where the clarity is good enough to see the fish, you're probably going to start to find them. Uh, keeping in mind things like, you know, that we've talked about so far, like the importance of vegetation, the importance of the bottom. A lot of the time they're going to like a little siltier bottom, but you'll find them all on gravel too. Um, th those are just some of my thoughts on like a system with large backwaters. Uh, that's not really to say a whole lot about the whole like progression of the season. Um, there's things that change, you know, the biggest fish, are generally going to be like on those flats and on backwaters earlier in places where they're going to spawn and then they might linger for a little while after they've spawned and stuff. Um, but like systems without backwaters, uh, I think one of the most important things there is like current speed. Um, you know, system with backwaters, it could be fast, it could be slow, but back the backwater factor is going to be pretty similar as long as it's deep enough, you know, they're going to be there. If there's no backwaters, that means your fish are stuck in the channel. And so uh, there's some factors that are going to be really important. So like uh, clarity is going to be huge in these situations um, because uh, if you don't have clarity, accessing the fish is going to be really difficult, um, especially if there's a lot of current. Uh, if, if there's low clarity and it's a river system with quite a bit of current um like i'm going to be spending a lot of my time on every eddy uh the softer the better um but the same the same as uh, uh, really kind of the same is going to apply though if there is current um the places where i'm looking if there is current is still going to be in the eddies and i think uh one of the mo most important things for me finding fish um on foot in a boat doesn't really matter is soft water with a, like a soft eddy with silt and down wood like those are just carp magnets in rivers uh fish just love to well in my uh uh embarrassing photos of the 10 last 10 last years that i posted uh, a week or so ago i've got a picture of dan posted up on a down tree working a fish and that down wood is just uh, really, really, th those are like little carp houses. They just love it. And so if, if I'm on a new, like if, if I was just teleported to a new, uh, uh, a new river and I was tasked with finding a carp, uh, if it was a river with current, I would look for where it slows up as much as possible. And I would just look at, at all of the slow eddies that have down wood and I would just hang out. Um, so I was checking out a new section of river last summer. It was just on foot. It was some public land. Um, and uh, cl clarity was actually way worse than I thought it was going to be. It was, uh, it was a system I had some familiarity with and I thought it was going to have more clarity and the clarity was really not great. Um, now there was a lot of interconnected canals and stuff. And so I saw, um, I wasn't fishing actually this day i just i just went for a walk but i saw some fish on like some backwatery canals and then when i got to the main channel um i realized i wasn't gonna be able to walk up and down it quite as well as i thought <clears throat> but the point that i walked out to is right where this canal joined the river and there was just a down uh like a down tree in the river and i just hung out there, there for a little while and within five minutes, a uh, carp moved up and kind of tailed and was like sucking on the log and feeding on the log a little bit. And then it just sort of moved along, uh, which is one thing in terms of like finding carp on rivers that I found really crucial. I kind of talked about it like with my little comment about 
uh, muddy water on some of those canals and streams that Larry fishes, but um, just having a sense of the water that they like. You know, if you're on moving water, softer water is going to be preferable. It's got to be shallow enough you can access them. But so just hanging out for five to 10 minutes in a spot where you know it's shallow enough that if a cart moves in, you're going to see it. And you also know that it's water that it seems like the like uh, is just extremely useful. And covering ground between spots like that can just be really important. So you just got to cover a lot of water sometimes. So, so I got a question for you, Luke, that, uh, because the, that you just mentioned uh, piqued my interest. On my still water stuff, I get to a flat. It doesn't look like there's any fish on it. I move. I go. I'm on the next flat. I'm pushing the next bay. I'm pushing. I'm pushing. I'm pushing. It sounds to me like in your rivers, you can have a tendency to say, "Hey, this water's good. There's a current break. It's soft. I've got some of the vegetation I'm looking for. I got some down timber." I think fish are going to be coming through here. So uh, tell me if I'm wrong here, but it sounds to me like you're more likely to find that fish are traversing and kind of coming to you in those scenarios than maybe I am on my still water fishing. Am I hearing that correctly? They definitely can. I've had that happen a lot. It, th th that happens to me especially uh, where there's a bit more current, um, and I know I've got clarity to be able to see them. Sometimes they're just kind of, they're out in the channel or they're moving up. Um, you know, it, I, I, so there's like two things. Uh, on the one hand, I think a lot of the time those softer eddies with down wood, those are like carp homes where like that's where they want to be. And you can kind of move in and sort of soft spook them. But as long as it's not like, but like that's where they want to be and they're going to circle around and end up back there again. Um, and then I guess sort of the flip side of that is, um, you know, you might have some water that isn't necessarily like one of those carp homes, but it's like, it's definitely the water they, the water type that they want to be in, or maybe it is uh, one of those places where they just kind of like reside there, uh, so to speak. Um, and they're just not there at the moment or something like that. Uh, just hanging out. I, I think it's always worth hanging out in likely spots to see fish move through. Um, like cattail points, uh, just anywhere near cattails where maybe you can't, for a variety of factors, maybe you can't uh, position yourself anywhere else. And like this spot X is the spot that you have to stand. Um, just hanging out and waiting for a fish to pass through, I think is, is a really useful thing. Um, so uh, I think that can be important, but uh, I, I also think one of the most important things in finding carp is covering, lot, is, is covering a lot of water, uh, looking where you uh, expect to find them. And if you don't see them or see evidence of them, moving on. Uh, we got a comment, what's the comment here? Yeah, yeah, I like uh, Connor's um, comment here. Act, act more like a bow hunter, moving water with limited habitat. Yep. Um, yeah, I know when I when I fished on foot a lot more, um, I would often think of it in terms of like shooting lanes and stuff, where it's sort of like uh, this is the spot. Like if I want to get a shot on a carp, I, I know they're in here. I can maybe see some fish downstream. Um, but I can't really go anywhere, so I'm just going to hang out here and wait till they pass through. Uh, I would do that a lot. So that's a big thing with grass carp, where our, um, in the waters that I fish. I mean, that's I know that's kind of a that's didn't we haven't really talked a lot about grass carp, but that is what's available to a lot of folks. And in my, the canals that I've fished, um, you know, with, with the slower moving water, you know, the whole entire water system is is available to commons and grass carp. But yeah. The current slow they can navigate it and it's essentially just like a slow moving lake. I mean, they can move in the middle, go out and feed, they can feed by shore. When the current is fast um, and whatever their food source is, is hanging up high, you know, a lot of times grass carp will just almost just drift with the current and just kind of feed with it. So then it really does pay to just sit and wait in a spot with a good, you know, somewhere where you can cast easily. There's, you know, you don't have trees hanging over your head and stuff um you know getting yourself in a good position the shooting lane as luke called it, it's perfect um and just let some of those fish come to you you know that's not there's a time and place for you know 
to, for doing either. So being flexible if you can is a is a is a good thing for a carp angler. Now one area. Yeah, I agree. Go ahead, Dan. I was going to say so, and and you you've sort of you know you've hit this point a number of times, but um, maybe a, a a way to log it in your brain is um, when I'm fishing moving water, especially the bigger uh, rivers. I think about carp like um like an ex super exaggerated way you'd think about trout right so with trout i'm thinking of i'm looking for holding water but maybe that holding water only needs to be this big to hold a trout with carp i'm thinking about it in a really exaggerated fashion where i'm thinking about where's the holding water but it's got to be able to hold 40 fish right so i'm still looking for big for like slow spots big back eddies for for big current breaks like you said with the down lumber i think that causes a lot of current break um, i'm looking for the softer water it just might not be like these micro spots it might be something where i'm looking for a place that that where a pod of fish could be uh, uh, rather than sort of like a singular fish yeah um and and that's kind of how i try to read those bigger rivers totally Totally. Yep. 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 I would agree. Yeah. And like a lot of the spots that I, you know, am ideally looking for are like those spot, like those soft eddy down tree stuff, you know, if you're on faster moving water uh, that are likely to hold like 10 or more fish, you know, or like yeah. five or more fish for right. sure. So, or like the inside bends that you get a nice big bend and you got a nice inside yeah. that'll oftentimes be a shallow flat first of all it'll oftentimes shallow out but it also is a very frequently a, a pretty serious current break yeah. or sort of as it reflects off on that bend if the water reflects off you'll oftentimes get a big soft spot in the back end yeah. but but, it, but instead of a micro spot you're looking for a macro spot that kind of has this yeah. those attributes yeah. right yeah and and uh i can't stress enough to just just looking closely. I know that sounds dumb, um, but looking closely because a lot of the fish are going to buck, you know, some of these rules. Like I've been walking around with Larry before and, you know, uh, on some spots with some pretty clear water, moving water. They're not always in those eddies. Sometimes they're like, if there's like a little bit of vegetation maybe in the river or just like uh, some detritus clump that has like maybe gotten caught on a rock or like, if you're on an urban stream, you know, there might be like a, like a piece of rebar or something sticking out and then like a, a dead clump of leaves or something gets caught there. That's detritus that fish just love and, and bugs love. And, you know, it might, there might be a bunch of current there, but there's three fish tailing on it. And uh, you just wait till you can get your shot. Um, yeah, that goes get in a presentation to like certain fish like this in a, in a later episode but that's like but that's something you look for i mean that's you know the all all these spots hold fish at different times it's get you know getting your fly to them is kind of a different story but that's you know that's like kind of the next step in this whole game that we're talking yeah. here <laughs> and then the, i was gonna yeah. say, then the last thing i wanted to like say a lot of the time my tactics on a big slow river are going to be a bit different. I am going to be just like totally covering water, trying to find anywhere that's shallow enough uh, that I can see fish. Um, and especially if it's like a big, slow, uh, maybe like dirtier river, um, I'm just covering water looking for activity. I'm looking for uh, fish nosing up against the bank, just sending little ripples. Uh, be quiet, listen, uh, you'll hear you know, you'll hear that just like as they're sucking on blades of grass or cattails or just other parts of the bank, right where the water intersects and land intersects, you know, you're going to find fish. Uh, Dude, so come, when, I, a lot of, you, when yeah, I die, a lot of go ahead. When I die, I'll know I went to hell if I look around and it's a big, wide, slow moving, dirty river. Because those fish could be anywhere, and you're right, man. You got to start looking with your ears. You got to get them up on the bank. You got to hope somebody's sucking a rock, because they're not going to be. You talked about density. I shouldn't say not going to be, but it's much harder to find places where they're actually concentrated in those in those situations. So I, I'm with you 100 percent on that. It it gets it's a, it gets to be a lot more challenging in that situation. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, or or it can be. I think. Uh, like I'm kind of lucky. I, I spend a bit of time on, uh, some stuff like that and, uh, the density is good. And, um, we haven't really talked about seasons. Uh, the only time, uh, that clarity is really an issue for me is early season. 
uh, they tend to be grouped up in the deeper parts of those backwaters. And when the water depth gets to a certain point, I just can't access them. Uh, you know, on, on a system like that, you just can't access them. Um, yeah, I think uh, we haven't really, like, said a whole lot specifically about this. We've talked a little bit about seasons, but a lot of this has just been assuming the average angler is just out there on, like, a nice summer day or something, right? Like, we've kind of we, – we've sort of implicitly assumed a little bit of that um, here, and that's kind of what I'm – like, when I'm talking about finding fish on rivers, I'm sort of like, all right, you, you know it's, like, the time of year where carp are active. Um, you know, where are we going to find them? So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I think, I think the important things, uh, talking about rivers are, uh, just be at, well, so there's the, the land and water access issue. And then, uh, so you need to be able to get to the river where you can get to the river. And then there's the clarity access issue. Um, and so those are, whether you're on a river or a lake, those are just really important things to, to think about and evaluate and consider in terms of how much time you spend on a spot and um, and how fast you move, it. so yeah, we want to each maybe maybe have one more t tidbit for the water that we talked about. I mean, I have a good one that I kind of didn't bring up that yeah. I want I want to for, for urban waters and and I guess this is we kind of all mentioned this a same type of habitat to look for. But in urban waters and like flood control reservoirs, small city ponds and stuff, it could be a big deal. And a lot of times those places, you know, especially since COVID, everybody likes to get outdoors and like hike and, get, you know, enjoy the weather, you know, outside like we do. Um, finding a spot on these lakes that is maybe less accessible to people without some effort um, is a big deal because if if there's people throwing rock, you know, kids throwing rocks in the water and stomping around, well, that's going to spook carp away from a spot. So if you can get to the backwaters of a body of, of water, like an urban lake, um, you're gonna you're gonna maybe have better luck anyway. But that's uh, you know usually those backwater spots have those attributes we kind of all mentioned. They're shallower, they're weedier, um, banks that are undeveloped and the water just goes to zero to wilderness, you know, in the ground, you know, it flattens out into like a, you know, a prairie or, or, or a forest right away. I mean, that's a good spot to look for. And that's where I would go to first in an urban lake. Um, season opens though. And first, you know, I, I like to say urban fishing in Omaha for carp starts on St. Patty's day. So that's early March. You know, I would hit a flood control Creek and look for tailing fish. There could still be ice on the on the main lakes, but year after year, before we get the spring rains, hit the creeks, they're low and clear, and they're going to be active fish on a sunny day. Yeah. Uh, well, to wrap up, what are we uh, – I, I didn't take as good of notes as I do on sometimes, but um, I think the access thing was some, uh, some things that we said were really important, no matter, like, what, what kind of system you're looking at. Uh, any other big ones that you guys uh, noted that we kind of covered that we think are just really important points, no matter what type, where somebody's looking? Soft. Um, you know, it's, we like it seemed, soft bottoms. That seemed to me like the sort of the consistent themes that we were, were across were um, you got you got to have visibility, and visibility is affected by depth, and so the combination thereof. Uh, uh, Larry, Larry focused a lot on uh, finding low head dams, finding some type of tail water if you can, finding some place where the water's moving, but you know it's more oxygenated, it's richer, but also it tends to be at least out here. I'm sure in, in Omaha too. Well, I know when I fished with you in Omaha, we did. Um, there's, it seems like there's a filtration effect, and you probably get a little bit of excess clarity as you get as you're closer to those to those uh, um, areas. Um, uh, you know, so that seemed to be kind of a consistent theme. I think another consistent theme that 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 I heard was um, uh, uh, the vegetation stance, and you know, uh, using things like uh, reeds or or cattails or whatever. It can indicate a backwater, indicate slower water, it can indicate a little water clarity, it can indicate a water depth that's shallower. Like that seemed like it was pretty consistent amongst uh, amongst all of us. Um, and then as far as the season goes, length, I heard from all of us. Well, I know I had one point in time where I, I caught, in South Dakota, I caught carp 
Um, I'm trying to remember. I think it was, I think it was 38 consecutive months. Um, so they're not just a July, August fish, right? And all of us, it sounds like, frankly, the shoulder seasons are probably when the bigger fish are shallower. We're looking in, you know, in, in a, a spring or fall. Um, but more importantly, like, if you got running water, I have got pictures of carp tailing next to ice shelves, right? And with the tail sticking out, but there's an ice shelf on them. If you got open water, um, you probably have carp feeding there. Um, well, they're probably feeding under the ice too, but, <laughs> but you got to have an open water to cast to it. So uh, look at the front and back end, at which point water temperature becomes important. And that's things like I talked about some of the back bays. Larry talked about some of the, the uh, uh, warm water discharges. You talked about the darkest bottoms, you know, that water temperature starts to drive things at those shoulder seasons. So yeah. uh, those are some consistent themes I heard from us. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Carp like, carp like veggies. They like their veggies. They like their bugs. They like soft water. They like wood. And we got to, and we got to be able to access them. So, yep. Yeah. Yep. And I think one of the big things is uh, cover a lot of water when you're out there looking for carp. Cover a lot of water. You're gonna you're gonna have dit, you're gonna have, have spots that are a total bust. Uh, but then you start to figure out what carp like, and you can suddenly find yourself looking at Google Earth and making the right guesses earlier on and spending less time, you know getting blanked and stuff so google earth is your friend i mean we've i think we've mentioned it probably every one of these videos that we've done so far google earth is your friend i mean you you know use use technology i mean you're it, everybody else has access to it and if you don't use it somebody else will and they'll find those fish you know if you're not looking for them so yep. you know use it to explore even even waters that you do know take a look at the google earth and maybe there's some maybe there's another you know the other side of the lake might be might be excellent or maybe you know a different season it'll be excellent so yeah use that technology and definitely if you're going on a vacation somewhere you know you know you're going to be in a city or, or you're going to be at a lake do a little bit of uh, leg work on your own ahead of time and it'll it'll pay off it just paid off for literally all three of us when we fished together and separately different times um, on, on a bunch of trips that I've been together with these guys, like just doing a little bit of research ahead of time, you know, can, can get, can go a long way. Yeah. Uh, I was, uh, I, I should have mentioned this. Uh, and then, uh, we really need to, uh, log this out, but I was fishing for bass on the Potomac in DC one time with a buddy and we weren't really getting fish and, but the river was up, veggies were flooded. And I was like, I, this just seems carpier than it does bassy right now. And we just started looking around, and then it was like, oh, yeah, there they there they are. So, yeah, I don't know. And don't be afraid to ask. I mean, I, I was on a trip to Louisiana, you know, to the marsh in uh, Venice, or no, not Venice, um, <laughs> Hopedale, you know, down for redfish. And, uh, you know, we had a day to kill, and it's a, we started asking around fly shops, and they're, they're like, oh, here, just go down to this canal, blah, blah, blah. Well, yeah, it was amazing for carp. I mean, we it was like one of the best carp fishing days I've had in a long time. So, you know, don't be afraid to ask a local if you're visiting from a different area too. Ask a local bait shop, a local guide service. They give you a tip. Nobody cares about carp most of the time. So that's what I was gonna say, <laughs> like, hey, man. They won't. They're not gonna tell you their best bass spot. They're not gonna tell you their best trout spot. But man, will they share? They might even drive yeah. you to their best carp spot. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. For yeah. sure. Well, guys, this has been a pleasure. I think there was uh, a lot of good info. Hopefully, hopefully. Uh, you know, people find it useful, um, or at least I, I highly suspect people will find it useful. It's not the be all end all of finding carp, but it should give uh, a lot of, uh, it should have a lot of good uh, good clues for people for to find fish kind of no matter what their local water is like. So. Yep. Tell yep. people where they can find these videos. Yes, uh, so uh, after this, uh, this will get posted to, uh, uh my instagram channel um actually what i should see if it's difficult or uh might actually look into uh doing like a joint post because i'm pretty sure like you can make a post with collaborators now which i don't know that we could do a year ago so actually we might all be able to post it to all of our um real instagram. our real section Yep, but you put, you're posting it on your YouTube channel as well, right? That's easy. That's easier to listen to as like a podcast. So yep. that's how yep. I would listen. And to then it. for now, yep, 
for right now, this is getting posted to the Freshwater Flats YouTube channel. Um, and then I'm also going to, I want to explore um, just uh, uploading the audio to um, as a podcast uh, going forward. I think that could be useful too, because then people could listen to it while they drive because it's not on YouTube. Well, Andy, then you don't have to look at us either, which is, you know. <laughs> so true. It's so true. Yeah. So uh, look at us. Just look at us. Oh, my God. Yeah. So that's been. <laughs> So this has been episode four of Carp Conversations. We've talked about finding carp. New hope. Uh, we're not exactly sure what we're going to talk about next time, uh, but it's likely to be either presenting to carp or grass carp. Uh, we will sort that out. We'll be back here pr probably in a couple of weeks. We'll sort that out as well. Uh, and you guys will be hearing from us soon. Nice to see everybody. Stay safe out there. Tie some yep. flies right now. Yep. yep. Enjoy winter. Everyone. Season's coming. Cool. All right. Well, good night, fellas. See y'all.